All right. And how many of y'all are bird people? Oh, it's about, about even. So, um, and I think a bunch of y'all raised your hands for both, which is great because what I was hoping to do was if there were some people who were mushroom people and some people who are bird people, hopefully after this conversation, you're, you're into both. Um, so um, I'm talking about ornithomycology today and I did not make up that word. It's a real word, but it's not used very often. Um, and uh, later on, I'll talk about how this is an under-researched um, topic. And a lot of the research is coming out of, you know, the last 10 years or so. Um, but I think what we're going to find as we continue to do some of this research is that there's more and more bird interactions with fungi than we, than we realize. Um, and so uh, just to start things off in a kind of fun way, I wanted to talk about fungi that... Um, it's working. There we go. Uh, fungi that have uh, bird names. Um, and so let's start off with the magpie ink cap, um, Copernopsis picasia. Um, and I'm going to struggle a little bit with Latin names. I think everyone kind of does. Uh, Alan Rockefeller, who's a, a mycologist, he says the only way, the only correct way to say a scientific name is quickly and with confidence. <laughs> because Latin is a dead language and and it doesn't really matter. Nobody's going to correct you if you're wrong, or they might, but uh, they're probably just as wrong as you are. Um, so anyway, the magpie ink cap is named so because of its colors, right? It's black and white uh, on that cap. Um, it's saprobic. Uh, does anyone not know what saprobic means? All right, good number of y'all. I'm going to do that every now and then because I'm talking to some mushroom people, I'm talking to some bird people, and I want to make sure that I define things real. Um, so probic means that it's a decomposer. And so you'll find these, these in wood chips usually, um, maybe in, in leaf litter. Um, and that's, that's where you're going to see these. Um, and then they're, they're cap and gills, deliquess. Um, and deliquess uh, is a term for liquefying, basically. So these things sprout up usually uh, overnight, really quickly. And then within the morning hours, they're usually uh, turning into liquid. Um, and so those caps and gills will just kind of liquefy. Um, uh, and then things might actually spread those spores in that liquid. So, you know, an animal walks by, steps on that liquid, and it keeps walking down an area. It might track those spores elsewhere. Flies might move them, move them around, things like that. Um, and I don't know how much, I, I'm just going to go for it and see, hopefully I don't ramble too long, but apparently the Nazis were actually using um, the ink from the ink caps to write letters to each other. And this was a way that they could verify that letters were, were coming from other Nazis and not from saboteurs who were trying to sneak letters to them. So um, be, whenever they got a letter from someone who they weren't sure if it was actually them, they would have to look at the ink under a microscope and see if they could see those spores and then they knew it was from uh, you know uh, another uh, Nazi. So anyway. Um, all right, turkey tail. So um Tremedius versicolor uh, are also sure. their appearance kind of looking like a fan out. Right. Um, and uh, they're saprobic as well. Um, but you usually see them on logs or um, snags, um, and very unlikely, but sometimes you'll find them in mulch as well. Um, and then they have pores on their undersides. So instead of having gills, you know, most mushrooms that you probably flip over, you see gills. These have little tiny holes on the underside, and that's where their spores are, are uh, released from. And they're medicinal. And um, I won't go totally into how they're medicinal because I don't really know all those details. Um, and then locally, we've used them for bioremediation. And um, we've done this in the green belt uh, where we inoculate wood with turkey tail mushrooms to help break down that wood. And the reason we're, we're doing that is because we're creating a lot of dead wood, trying to remove these invasive species. 
and then now that dead wood is a potential fire hazard. And so if we can find a way to turn that wood back into soil more quickly, then we have less of a fire hazard, right? So um, that's something that we've been doing um, in the green belt and um, in other parts of Austin as well. Then there's a the false turkey tail, also has turkey in the name, and it's named that because it looks like a turkey tail, but the turkey tail mushroom. Um, but it's a totally different genus um, where the turkey tail has pores on the on the underside. The false turkey tails are just completely smooth, at least to the, to the naked eye. Um, also saprobic, you would find them growing the same types of environments as, as turkey tail. Um, yeah. Chicken of the woods. Um, so this is um, an edible mushroom that we have here in Central Texas, uh, named for its taste and texture. So has anyone here tried chicken of the woods? Quite a few of y'all. Uh, did y'all find them locally in town? Yeah, I'm seeing some heads nod. Um, so uh, we see these pretty often in the fall here in Austin, and you'll see them on uh, live oaks. And most often I see them on live, live oaks. Um, but you can also find them on dead, dead trees as well. Um, and so these are, I like to think that they're saprobic, um, as in they're eating the, the dead heartwood of, of these trees. So they're not actually, I don't think, uh, decomposing live tissue. Um, and we'd have to get into a little bit of tree anatomy, but uh, when you're when you're looking at a tree, only the kind of outer part of the tree is alive. That's where you have the the xylem, phloem, cambium, and bark, and then kind of the, all the interior part is old xylem, and um, some of it is active xylem, some of it's not. It's just kind of dry wood and it's structural, um, and so these. Fungi, when you see them on a live tree, are eating the heartwood of the tree, which is that dead part of the tree. So in a way, they're saprobic, but uh, if you also say that they're on a live tree and they're, they're causing issues, you could also argue that they're parasitic. Um, uh, they also have pores on the underside, and um, yeah, as I mentioned, they're locally found on plateau live. Okay, here's a here's one that's not very local at all. This is uh, called the blue pink gill, and um, this one's found in New Zealand. Um, and the name uh, that was given to it by the indigenous people is Wede Wede. I'm probably butchering this. Wede Wede Kokaku, and um, the Kokaku part comes from this bird that is called a Kokaku. And it has little blue patches below its beak. And there is this legend that the reason that those blue patches exist on the bird's cheek is because it would rub its cheek on these mushrooms. Um, and so uh, I don't know that that's ever been verified, but that's the legend. Um, this mushroom is also saprobic, a decomposer. Um, it has reddish pink spores. And um, unknown edibility, and it's been uh, studied a little bit for its potential use for dyes, for a blue dye. Um, also, New Zealand is the only uh, country to have uh, a mushroom on any bill. Um, so they have the, the Kokako bird and the mushroom on their $50 bill. Um, and um, Liv Sasan just released a book to, if anybody's interested in mushrooms of New, New Zealand, um, she just released a book uh, that features this mushroom on the cover. Uh, and just to jump through a few others so we don't spend forever on this, we got Hen of the Woods, the parrot wax calf or parrot mushroom, uh, Dryad Saddle, which is also called the pheasant's back, and the chicken fat mushroom, um, not to be confused with chicken of the woods. All right, so there's also mushrooms that have egg stages. Um, Amanitas have an egg stage, um, and these are this is a whole genus of, of mushrooms. Um, 
these are mushrooms that have gills and um, some are edible, some are deadly. Um, maybe you've heard of the destroying angel. That's what got angel into, into mycology in the first place. Um, and uh, they're mycorrhizal, so they're ectomycorrhizal. And that, who doesn't know what mycorrhizal? All right, we got some hands. All right, so mycorrhizal means that it forms relationships with trees. And it's a form of mutualism where the uh, mushrooms help the tree uh, absorb water, nutrients, things like that. And then the trees provide some sugars and things to the mushrooms as well. Oh. Um, so let's see. Another mushroom that has an egg stage are the stinkhorns. So um, Nicole saw a stinkhorn recently. Um, and so these start out in kind of a white egg like stage as well. Um, and this is a whole family of mushrooms. The family's called Bellaceae. Um, if you've seen a lot of stinkhorns, you know why it's called Bellaceae. Um, so there's some very phallic uh, mushrooms there. Um, and they're saprobic as well. You'll find them in mulch typically or dense leaf litter. Um, and they've got these uh, this brown libia. I don't know if you can see it in that column or stinkhorn, but there's some brown kind of in the interior, this like gooey brown looking stuff. And that's called glebia. And that's this kind of liquid that contains the spores. And the mushrooms smell really bad too. They smell funky. Um, depending, uh, Johnny, I think you kind of like the smell. Is that right? <laughs> uh, and maybe there's some debate as to whether they, they smell good or bad. But, um, uh, so anyway, flies are attracted to it, beetles, maybe some other things, and they'll land on that glebia. And then they also, you know, fly around, they land on, on other mulchy areas and they deposit those spores and then you start having stink ones pop up elsewhere. So um, that's a way that they get their spores dispersed. And then uh, we have bird's nest fungi, um, Nidula racy. These are, this is a whole family of fungi as well. Um, and uh, they resemble a nest and eggs. Uh, they're saprobic, uh, again, growing in mulch. Um, they have this paradiol, um, which contains spores, and they splash out of the cup when it rains. Um, and they can splash yes. up your way. Wow. Um, and there's also this thought that herbivores spread the spores as well. So when the, the um, little paradiol, paradioles, Flash out of the cup, they might land on some vegetation. Then some herbivore comes along, they eat the vegetation, and then they, you know, travel around and then they uh, poop somewhere else. And um, there's a lot of these dumb loving birds nest fungi, so they'll, uh, you'll see them popping up in in or around the poop, and that's probably because an herbivore deposited it. And um, if y'all have been out to Blair Woods quite a bit, um, trails and I see these pretty regularly at Blair Woods. So keep an eye out, especially after rain or when it's been pretty wet for a while. Okay, so jumping from that, let's talk about birds' nests, actual birds' nests. Um, hum hummingbirds utilize lichens on their bird nests. Um, this is an image coming off of iNaturalist. So a lot of my research came off of uh, Google Scholar and iNaturalist. That's where I pulled a lot of stuff from. Um, but uh, so maybe some of y'all are like, why is he talking about lichens in this fungi talk? Fungi are, are a part of lichens. So um, all lichens have some fungi associated with them. Most often an ascomycete, that's just a cup fungus. Uh, I won't go into too much detail. And, but then there's also this counterpart of an algae or cyanobacteria. And then what we're finding more and more is that there might be other players involved in, in lichens as well. So sometimes there's yeast, sometimes there's basidiomycetes and all kinds of other fungi. Um, but anyway, the point is uh, that, that birds are utilizing these, these lichens to, to build their nests. And as you can see, it really helps the nest blend in, especially when they're building it on a, on a tree. Um, that has lichens on it already. Um, and you see the same thing with blue-gray gnatcatchers. Um, 
So here's an image of a blue gray gnat catcher nest. Um, and then um, vireos, uh, I've seen some vireo nests as well that have lichens on them. So um, whether or not they're, they're just kind of being picked up uh, as part of the twig or uh, I can't really tell, you know, but I've seen the nests and I've seen, uh, I wish I had a laser pointer that I could, you know, point out lichens in both of those uh, nests there. Um, there's some kind of filamentous ones in the one on the right. Um, anyway, uh, speaking of, of vireo nests, this is a nest in uh, East Texas, and there's aerial rhizomorphs in the nest. Um, and you can't really easily see them from this picture, but there's basically these little black strands, and I'll, I'll have another slide where maybe you can see them a little better. Um, there's these little black strands, and those are aerial rhizomorphs. Um, so aerial rhizomorphs are um, multiple hyphal strands, basically little mycelial strands that are all growing so close together to kind of form a thick hair-like structure. Um, and you can kind of see them on this leaf here. Um, it just kind of looks like hair, like thick black hair on the leaf. Um, and this is a strategy that fungi uh, evolved to basically grow on sticks um, that are dangling, you know, from a tree or might still be on the tree on a snag um, and capture leaf litter and other sticks before it hits the forest floor. Because the forest floor is very competitive with other fungi. But if, if the fungi can catch um, little leaf litter and twigs before it hits the ground, then they basically have no competition, right? So if you're walking around the woods of East Texas, if you're in a tropical area, you can find these. But um, on sticks, just, you know, as you're walking by, you might see these little hair-like things, and those are aerial rhizomorphs. And some of these um, never have a breeding body, or they've never been recorded with a breeding body, but the ones in East Texas that I've found do. Here's a little um, breeding body there at the bottom, and there, that one was associated with some aerial rhizomorphs. Um, they tend to be in the uh, either Merasmus genus or in Merasmiana, which is kind of this broader group, including Merasmius, the pinwheels, and some other fungi. Um, so here's that same nest from above. And let's see if I can use it. So right around here, you can see kind of some black strands. And that's the aerial rhizomorphs in that nest, I think. All along the stick, there might be some too. And so there might be some mutualism going on here where the, the fungus actually gets to break down some of that nest material too. And it's probably not doing so at a rate that it really affects the birds. Um, so, um, and there have, I did see online, there's some pictures of the fruiting bodies in the nest as well. So, you know, after a good rain or something like that, they'll put out fruiting bodies. So you'll see these little mushrooms inside the nest, which is pretty cool. So. Um, okay, so red cockaded woodpeckers actually disperse uh, fungi. And um, so they did a study. And do I have the? Oh, no. So they did a study in, let's see, 2016. Um, and basically, they were swabbing red cockaded woodpeckers, and they realized that they had this whole slew of fungi on their feathers. Um, and so then they, they did a second part of the study where they, they created all these nest boxes for red cockaded woodpeckers um, and they put them in the trees um, and half of them they caged so that the, the red cockaded woodpeckers couldn't get in and half of them they just left open. Um, and then after a season of breeding, they went to all the ones that were nested in, they uh, determined which fungi were in those nests and then they looked at the ones that were caged and they could tell that there was this distinct difference between uh, the fungi that were in the ones that birds had nested in versus the ones that um, were not nested in, that were caged off. And the, the fungal composition or the, the species composition of those fungi matched the ones that were on the feathers 
So they're carrying around these spores and bringing them into their nests. And that would just help um, probably create more decay and help uh, uh, make that wood softer, that hardwood softer, as we talked about earlier. And that allows for uh, more excavation of that uh, tree. Um, and one thing you'll see is that woodpeckers seem to be associated with with fungi over and over uh, with their nests. And it's probably just because those, those fungi are uh, creating decay in the wood um, and then making that wood softer so that cavities can be excavated. Um, and as you can see, a lot of times this, those fruiting bodies of the fungi are, might be right above a cavity. So you can imagine when the spores are falling out of that, that fungus, they're kind of getting on the nest, they're kind of like landing on the woodpecker, and their feathers are probably, you know, covered in some of these spores. Um, yeah, I got a question. Sure, why not? Do the birds eat some of the fungi? Let's find out. Um, uh, we're not there yet, but we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Um, all right, so Keystone Complex. Um, so, uh, how many of y'all, who hasn't heard of a keystone species? Everybody, no, there's a quick group. Okay, so a keystone species is um, a species that has an unusually large impact on an ecosystem despite its relative abundance. So, and then if you were to remove the keystone species, major parts of the ecosystem might collapse, right? So, um, uh, Beavers are, are kind of the textbook example, right? So the beavers create all this habitat um, for all these other animals. If you were to remove a beaver from the ecosystem, all these other species that are dependent on um, that backed up water that beavers create, um, all of a sudden they're, they're no longer able to survive. And um, now Keystone Complex is when several species are interdependent and create and of those species, they, they create a lot more um, habitat and benefits for other wildlife. And removing any one of those in the Keystone Complex kind of has that, that same kind of effect. Um, and so uh, there was a study done and basically they were realizing that there's this Keystone co Complex between red nape sap sapsuckers, uh, willows, aspen, and a heartwood rot. Uh, fungus. So the hardwood rock fungus is the willow bracket, uh, Felinus, Felinus igniarius. Um, and basically, um, the wood rot fungus makes that soft uh, hardwood that allows for excavation by the woodpecker. Uh, that woodpecker, you know, makes these cavities in the trees. Um, is the sapsucker the same as the woodpecker? Or am I can I use that interchangeably or not? Sapsucker, it's technically a sapsucker, right? Um, and then um, specifically that, that fungus is, uh, uh, it needs willows or aspens as its host. Um, and uh, so the sapsucker has this kind of dual role too, that's the interesting part. So it creates habitat, not by, it just not only by making cavities, but also by doing the thing that sapsuckers do, which is making all these holes in the trees, making all the sap um, come out of those holes. And there's insects, there's um, other birds, there's other mammals that, that feed from that sap. Um, and then there's also these birds that rely on cavities that the red sap sapsucker makes for nesting. Um, and two of those are the tree and the violet green swallow. They're completely dependent on um, on those cavities that are created by those birds. So anyway, by removing any one of the red nape sap, sap sucker, the willow, the aspen, or the wood rot fungus, all of a sudden you lose kind of the rest of that complex, and then you have these cascading effects on the on these other uh, wildlife who, who depend on them. Okay, bowerbirds. Um, there's some evidence of bowerbirds mushroom collecting. I could only find one example on iNaturalist, but there's this 
Um, Bowerbird, a, a male holding a mushroom in his mouth, presenting it to a female. And then, uh, yeah, it says male courting a female with a mushroom in his beak is the notes on that one. And then they had a second picture and it was of the mushroom. I guess it dropped it. And um, the person walked up and took a picture of the mushroom. Um, and uh, there was also um, these notes that came out um, in 2016, kind of researching the idea that, that bowerbirds uh, collect mushrooms. And there's, there's some anecdotal evidence. There's just not a whole lot of, of documented evidence yet. Um, but it's an interesting thought and it would make sense. One thing they propose is these uh, fluids are, you know, colorful. It's something that they might be interested in collecting to impress mates because of the color. Um, and so something that could be further studied and, and perhaps, um, you know, some interesting interactions could be uh, found there. Um, Eating mushrooms, here we go, or insects associated with mushrooms. What you'll see is on iNaturalist, there's plenty of observations of birds uh, either eating mushrooms or eating insects off of mushrooms. So Downy Woodpecker, Carolina Chickadee, Canada Jay. Um, and then somebody talked about seeing some wild turkeys kind of rummaging through some mushrooms and it's kind of the after, after um, the damage of, of the turkeys. Um, okay, eating mushrooms. Um, so we've got the cassowary and the Australian brush turkey. Is that what's called? Um, and both of these have been documented eating mushrooms. Um, so there was a, two different uh, studies that talk about these. So one of them uh, was actually a study of mammals, but they talked about how uh, already that cassowaries and um, Australian brush turkeys have uh, are muscular mycorrhizal fungi in their feces. So, um, uh, and we're gonna get into another study that, that documented that as well. So we talked about amanitas, how they're mycorrhizal. They um, attach the outside of the roots and help the plants that way. There's our muscular mycorrhizal which uh, are inside the roots there. Um, and they, they still benefit the plant as well in the same kind of ways. Um, and so, um, and then there was a camera trap detection study and it found all these um, uh, amanitas that kept popping up on the camera traps. And they kept saying that certain animals would come by and eat the amanitas. And Australian brush turkeys were one of them that would kind of come by and eat those amanitas. And um, truffles. And um, so there's there's kind of been uh, a few interesting things related to birds and truffles. There was a study um, about black-throated hewitt hewitts and the Chukau tap tapaculo. Um, and these birds were documented uh, with evidence of, of eating 20 different truffle species. Um, and so these are birds that are foraging around on the forest floor, um, digging up truffles and consuming them. Um, apparently in Kuwait, uh, there's a truffle there and the name that they the people of Kuwait have given it is the bird's fungus, um, because I guess birds have been associated with, with finding those truffles. Um, and Byron and Turkey, uh, people forage based on where birds are gathering. They um, have noticed that birds seem to gather in areas that are, that are productive for mushrooms. Um, and then uh, Aboriginal Australian tribe uses um, bird behavior and calls to, to determine what mushrooms might be where. Um, uh, so yeah. Um, okay, going back to the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, um, there was a study done uh, in 2018, and it was 
noting that the Sardinian warbler and European robin uh, deposit our muscular mycorrhizal fungi in their, their um, droppings. And basically what they did is they took a bunch of bird droppings, they had sterilized soil and sterilized conditions, and they grew every, of the, every one of these seeds that they found in the bird droppings. Um, and uh, basically they found that some of these species, um, I think it was mostly a rubus species, so like a, a blackberry, um, it was growing. And so there was the seed present in the, in the uh, dropping, but also the, the mycorrhizal fungi that were associated with that plant um, in the dropping. And then they, they were able to pull up the roots and determine that both of those were there and they were it was in the sterile system. So they must have been in the bird dropping together. Um, um, there's another study in 2016, and uh, it was basically looking at um, these non-specialized flower visiting birds. So not like your hummingbirds, but just, you know, a bird that might eat a lot of seeds or insects, but occasionally visits a flower. Um, and basically, uh, there's this relationship between if well, birds have a lot of pollen on them, there was this high pollen. <laughs> also had a lot of spores on them. And so the idea is that they're picking up um, not only pollen, but spores from those flowers. Um, and it's it was a pretty low um, total percentage of birds that um, had spores on them. So it was only about 15%. But it's still interesting to note that um, these birds had and, and were carrying around spores. Um, another keystone complex, uh, this one is between the northern spotted owl. Uh, there's actually three species of squirrels involved with this one, uh, truffles and Douglas firs. Um, and so uh, these squirrels are, are the ones wanting to eat the truffles. Um, the truffles have a mycorrhizal relationship with the Douglas firs. Um, and the owls depend on those Douglas firs for nesting sites. Um, and so, um, anyway, remove any one of those in that system, and the others will start to, to struggle. Um, and so, that's another example of a keystone complex there. Um, okay, parasitic fungi. So, um, there is a couple of studies, well, really just one kind of about the parasitic fungi, but there's these keratinophilic fungi. Basically, they like keratin. So they um, specialize in breaking down keratin. So there's, these are not only uh, relevant for birds, but they're relevant for reptiles or relevant for, for humans. Um, so, you know, fingernails are, are made up of a lot of keratin and people get those like nail fungus, right? Um, but uh, there's similar, and so it wouldn't be the same species necessarily that would affect birds, but birds have keratinophilic fungi that affect their feathers. Um, and basically, uh, there was a study done uh, looking at the goshawk and some of its prey. So they were looking at feathers that were found uh, at or below the nest of their prey. And and then they were sampling the same birds that weren't preyed upon, that were just out in the wild. And they found that um, their prey, the feathers of their prey, had 50% more fungal colonies than just wild birds. So basically, you know, these birds have a fungus that's affecting their feathers. It's probably affecting their ability to fly, dodge, dodge another bird. Um, and so they are more likely to become prey for, for another bird. Um, and um, there's another study that was about how behavior will impact the likelihood of bacteria in their plumage. Um, it's not exactly fungi, but I would, you know, venture to guess that these same kind of behaviors would would um, influence the amount of fungi in their in their feathers as well. Basically, the study was saying that birds who forage on the ground a lot tend to have more bacteria on their on their feathers. So you would might you might also assume that 
for the same types of birds would have more fungi in their feathers, but we don't know for sure. Somebody's got to do the study. Um, yeah. And then um, getting high highs. So there's this little bird called a high high um, in New Zealand. And um, so it's, it's a pretty rare bird only because um, we've introduced all these mammals to New Zealand that are, you know, having this huge detriment to a lot of birds. Um, and and uh, so these birds are in a, a, a sanctuary and there was a group of young kind of fledgling birds and they supposedly were kind of experimenting with new foods and they, they just tried eating some little mushrooms and they started like kind of acting goofy, spasming and uh, acting really strange, but they were all fine. None of them got really sick or anything, um, but, but it was just a little like teenage experimentation. Um, and they were reportedly tripping, but everything's good. So, um, um, okay, well, we're gonna start wrapping things up here. Um, just to conclude, ornithomycology is an understudied field of science. Um, I included dates with all these. I forgot to mention it every time, but um, there's a lot of uh, recent research um, on this and hopefully it continues to grow um, and we'll see more interesting interactions going forward. Um, here's the study that was called ornith Ornithomycology, an overlooked field of study. Um, and they talked a lot about the same kind of things that I did. So birds that use it for nesting, birds eating mushrooms, um, birds uh, dispersing spores and their droppings, things like that. Um, so bird mycophagy, parasitism, mutualism, and spore dispersal may be more common than we realize. Um, and uh, I think iNaturalist is a great way to document these behaviors. So if you um, see birds eating mushrooms, take photos, uh, document it, and write it in the notes section of, of iNaturalist so that you know people can filter by keyword and look for you know so select the explore button go to um, birds and then type in mushrooms and select for any time that birds have been seen with mushrooms and then you know somebody can actually do some research and collect collect some more um, interesting data from that citizen science app um let's see we do have a couple of trivia questions so we should we have two or just one Yeah, yeah, that works. Okay, so we're gonna do one for in, we're gonna do one in person trivia question, and we're gonna do one online. We'll do the in person one first. Should I go ahead with that? Yeah. Let's okay. See. All right. So I'm just gonna pick the first person to see. All right. And do we want to say what the prize is? Sure. <laughs> Sorry, didn't want y'all to read it. Yet. Um, okay, so the prize is uh, the latest uh, Audubon uh, Society Mushroom Field Guide. Yeah, and it just came out. It just came out this year? April 2023. April 2023, Brian's making new. Um, so um, this is the in person one. Um, first person to raise their hand um, gets the answer. All right. Which bird is part of a keystone complex with willows, aspens, and a hardwood uh, rock fungus? Yes. What kind? Ooh. Oh. All right, who's next? Uh, I think you're next. Red nape sap sucker. Me. That's right. Yeah. Okay, are, are we ready for the online one? Yeah, everybody okay. ready online? Is our trivia. Okay. Name three mushrooms with bird names. Ah. <laughs> in the chat. Drop it in the chat. First person. Ooh. Bird's oh. nest fungus, chicken of the woods, magpie ink cap. I think that counts. Bird's nest yeah. is a little, All right. a little big, but we'll go with that. Ryan, if you can just um, email us your, your info, your mailing address, and I'm putting the 
the, the, email, address. the email address. Um, and then we'll just move into questions. Um, anybody have any questions? Um, these are a bunch of birds' nests, fungi, and I I can mirror I mirrored the image. Um, yeah. Um, we got one in the back. Henry. That's a good question. Um, and I don't know if I fully have the answer to that. Do you, do you have a good answer for that, Angel? Sorry, I was looking at questions on the Zoom. So, the so certain fungi like in caps have this ability to just spring up overnight so quickly. Um, how is it that they're able to, to do that so quickly? Yeah, when, I don't like, know it takes plants. specifically why. I don't know why. No. It's probably, yeah, I, don't, I could try to make up an answer to that. They're a lot of water and they're probably making these, I don't want to say non complex cells, but you know, they're not necessarily like with a all lot those. of chitin, probably not yeah, as much chitin. It's not, do you have an answer? Okay. So his answer was that the, the um, they're being inflated with water. Um, so they start out, you know, they're not necessarily making new cells, they're just being inflated with water. Any other questions? I don't know, what's it called, Angel? Uh -huh. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I always forget the name. Um, I would assume smell because truffles are known for, for having a scent and they're usually um, underground. So, you know, uh, a visual cue isn't gonna be necessarily that, that helpful for finding truffles. Um, so yeah, that would be my, my guess is that they're using some. Yeah, maybe they can hear them if they're growing really fast. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Chris. Um, well, so it's indicative that there's either, it, it's complicated. Um, it's either a parasite on healthy live tissue, or it could be a hardwood rotting, rotting fungus. So um, I'm sure pretty much all of you have seen a tree with a hollowed out inside. And maybe some of y'all have seen a tree with a hollowed out inside that has been alive since you were a kid, you know, and it's still up and alive fine, right? Um, now, there's some question of, if it loses its in insides, is it a hazard to your house? Potentially, um, but if it's in the middle of the woods, it might stay alive for you know, 50 years, I think, or years. So, um, so um, I guess that that's to say you have to kind of ID the mushroom, have an idea of, is this a parasitic one on live tissue? Is this one that's eating just dead heartwood fungus? or heartwood, sorry, and then make a decision from there if it's in your yard, like maybe call an arborist and have them assess your tree as to structural things. And of course, make sure you trust your arborist too, because they might be trying to make a buck and just want to put them in your tree. Um, so, a reminder to repeat question. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Do you all want me to repeat the question? Do you all hear it? It, it was... This is on uh, Zoom people. Okay. It was... Um, if you see a fungus on a tree, is that a, is that indicative that the tree is in poor health? 
Okay, we have, um, do we have some more in-person questions? If not, there's several on the online that we can get to. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some differences in, in what's toxic to us versus what's toxic to them. Um, but uh, I don't know enough details to, to say exactly. Um, but I would guess that there are some differences. Some birds are probably um, able to eat certain ones that are toxic to us that are not toxic. To us. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, Karen asks, have you thought to expand your work into lichens too? As in just researching this into lichens a little bit more? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I probably should have done a little more digging on, on the lichen side. Um, you know, I brought up the bird's nests that utilize lichens, but um, I didn't uh, research much more than that. So yeah, that's, that's an interesting way I might be able to add a few more slides. I can find some, some interesting stuff there. Okay, so Anne asks, what is the source of the ink cap letter story? Um, as in a, um, like an actual study or something? I think so, yeah. I don't know if I have, have one, but uh, I guess it's it comes secondhand from uh, Alan Rockefeller who, who brought that up. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. Other yeah, there's like four or five more. Um, so James asks, how is the edibility of a mushroom determined in the status of the edibility if the edibility is unknown? That's a confusing question for me. Uh, I guess the question is, how do you determine the edibility of a mushroom? That's and at, at what point do you just say uh, it's unknown? Um, <laughs> uh, I guess if it's if it hasn't really been tried, then it's unknown. Uh, and and I think people have different methods for for determining edibility. I think um, yeah. there were some people in East Texas that, that I met like foraging who who were interested in um, trying to determine edibility. So they would just you know try tiny bits of mushrooms and determine if it made them feel kind of sick or not. And if it did, so maybe they try a little different. Um, so They're one thing that there. we like to always talk about as as um, as fun, fun guys and gals um, is uh, the um, the fact that you can't really get sick from just handling mushrooms. So feel free to touch mushrooms all you want. Um, you also can. Uh, Chew on mushrooms, and I'm not advocating that everyone do, does this, but you can chew on poisonous mushrooms, get kind of tasty notes, and then spit it out, and you're not going to get sick. Um, and so, um, that's what a lot of mycologists. Yeah, famous mycologists will do it. Um, and they're like narrowing things down. Yeah, just to you know, if, if they might try some and be like, oh, this is peppery. This is this species of bacteria. So, um, yeah. So uh, Talit asks, so what percentage of birds do you imagine have a relationship with fungi? Is it most, a few, or somewhat in between? Somewhere in between. Yeah, um, I don't know. I think an interesting study would just be like swabbing every bird, you know? Um, <laughs> just if you're misnetting, like why not just give it a little swab and, and um, see if there's spores. And yeah, just see if there's spores on it because, you know, there's probably spores on all of us too. So in a way, you could probably say that we're all uh, associated with that. Um, yeah, everything's kind of interconnected in some way. And so even if there's not necessarily a direct connection, maybe there's some of these, these stone complexes or whatever that you know, you're moving fungus from, from the ecosystem and all of a sudden it's like, why don't we see these types of birds? Um, yeah. Um, any other questions there or in person? Um, someone wanted to know what this, uh, the source of this photo. And then, I think we need to go to the next slide. And then uh, what species is this one? 
Um, that's a good question. It's, um, let's see, is it the fluted? I think it's a fluted uh, bird's nest, which I can't remember the scientific name of right now. Um, it's it's my photo. I took it. I was at the Houston Arbor Human Nature Center. I worked there for three and a half years, and that's kind of where my passion for fungi really um, uh, mycelia is from. Any other questions? That was it on Zoom. All right. And um, did you want to make the announcement? Oh, you yeah, wanna, yeah. You kind of talked about it we already. Have, but... Yeah, we talked about it a little bit already, but our next uh, month's uh, meetup will be at Annie's Day and Night on Riverside. And we're going to be doing our Bulba Lab kick kickoff. So get our emails, look out for a sign up, um, and we're going to have kind of an ideation. Uh, uh, exercise leading up to the event where people can use AI art, draw uh, their ideas for the mobile lab with ink cap, uh, ink cap, ink, or however, however uh, low tech or high tech you want to go. So uh, just share ideas with us online, and then we're going to meet up and, and do more ideation together for this grand mobile lab. But this was a fun one that I made. I, I forget which art AI thing I use, but I thought it was cute. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Chris, everybody. Oh my God. Yeah. Happy birding. Happy mycelating. Travis Audubon, we take a break for the summer. So we will see you at our next speaker series in September.